We've partnered with Bethesda Game Studios to build a filming model of the Frontier ship from their upcoming game, Starfield. I couldn't be more excited for this project. It's a celebration of the exact kind of practical effects filmmaking I'm obsessed with and that we all love. Follow along over the coming weeks as the tested team and I embark on a scale miniature build that combines the latest fabrication technologies with my favorite old school model making techniques. Let's dive in. Cable routing, yes. So I tried as hard as I could to sort of tidy it all up it's to the great. outside. Yeah. And we're gonna need to just, um, I guess, figure out how how best to hide what we can. Yeah. Um, so I think up here it could literally be. We actually lay down a panel of styrene here. Oh, okay. With a leading edge, like we hide all of that. Mm -hmm. There's no reason to get elaborate. It actually, adding detail here takes it away from here. So I've got some black styrene and I can, ease, we can I think we should just like plan to sock that in. Okay. Um, and then coming off back here, you, we've got all this lovely C channel and H channel. So what are you, first of all, okay, you're right. You've got heat shrink on all of the, wow. You got it on all of them. Yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this one took a bit of time. Yeah. Um, yeah, the resistors uh, are somewhat exposed just because we want to have some heat. Sure. But I feel like with the, the siren covering it, I don't I don't think we should worry too much about it. No, I don't. I don't. Um, tell me what you've already been thinking so I don't like yeah, run over so a I've, plan. So basically, like, this is, I've sort of mapped out where I think mm -hmm, everything mm -hmm. should be routed to since we want it to all kind of go towards the center. I, yeah the backlight here, and then these all kind of come in from the side. Okay. There was not really a good spot for me to hide, unfortunately, this part yeah. snaking through. So um, this is the only one where I'm like, hmm. All right, and <clears throat> all that really needs to happen is that all these umbilical back to a central location. Yes. And then, all oh, right, so we've got, I see, get a metal post. Okay. Right, a hollow metal post that will come down to the base. Oh, interesting. That okay. will be the stance. So we'll we'll be able to route these through that. Oh, interesting. Okay. That will be my goal. Is that these? I don't think I have to hide. I think I hide this. I hide this. I hide that. Under here, I can be a little looser. Okay. And it's gonna. It goes inside a metal post that we have access to from the from the underside and the overside, okay. right? So we can get our umbilical in to plug all these in. Perfect. It's like eight plugs or something like yeah, that. Yeah, so there's like gonna be one more from like the, um, there's like the cockpit. Right, right, like right. Sort of monitors, okay. and that can't be installed unfortunately until everything has been finished. Okay. But that, that's, that seems like it would work out fine. We just snake it in, I think, at the tail end. Is that, this is roughly where it's gonna come out? What do you um, think? Or maybe actually it's probably best if it comes out here. Yeah, so I guess like we just need to make like some sort of pilot hole to mark that. Great. And... I'm gonna make a mark. And then is there anything else? This is coming down over here. This is great. This is cool. great. This should be really fun. I think that the the last thing that we should probably yep. focus on is that there is this like sort of uh, detachable monitor that's gonna be living here. Mm -hmm. And I have the light for it. Great. So we have this <laughs> oh, that's pretty so sweet pretty. panel for it. Yeah. Um, but it has to, unfortunately, because this thing is removable, I ended up having to put it on a separate circuit. Right. So we just need to figure out a good way to sort of hide the battery pack and still have access to the switch when we want to turn it on. Okay, so let me see this. Great, I, so this is, I could just make this integral to the door and it attaches into here, yeah? Yeah. Great, okay, cool. Okay. That that's Sweet. like that sounds like a lot of fun. I'll awesome. ju I'll jump on this. Dude, the lights just make everything pop. Yo, yeah. <laughs> it's, I, I, like, I've, I've been loving it on. It's just it's got this nice like blue like nice blue glow and it just yeah makes it feel like a ship. It really does. All right, I'll jump on this and I'll bring it over when it's done. Awesome. Thank you. Sweet. Thanks, Adam.
By the way, I can't remember if I've mentioned this on the channel before, but one of the ways I hold my sanding sticks is directly a response to watching my colleagues get carpal tunnel. So instead of like this, I hold it about as loosely as I can in a very light touch, just levered against my palm with my, in this case, my ring and my thumb, or middle finger and my thumb. And I'm just, it's a very light touch. starting to hide some crimes. That's lovely. I can do one more. Happy, happy. Let's see here. Wait, no, that's not the one. Not the one? That's the one. Oh, yeah, that's the one. Oh, yes. Awesome. 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 So now this guy. Out. <laughs> nice. Then the, oh, oh. That's not good. Okay. Wow, that's a deep cut. Point nine. We go to point nine. <laughs> All right. So now what I have is a discrete power pack for this light, which goes in here and it can wrap around the back and put a panel on that light. It's ideal. All right. One rule of masking, there will always be overspray. That's another one. There will always be overspray, no matter how careful you are. I mean, look, maybe you're, um, maybe you're one of my old colleagues like Peggy Raster or Kim Smith or Lauren Vogt or Melanie Wayless, and you don't have overspray, but the mortals among us, the human painters, unlike those geniuses, uh, there will always be overspray. So, you just got to resolve yourself that you're going to have to fix some crimes that you've left 
with your masking. All right, now I want, that's good, that's good, that's good. I'm happy with that, I'm happy with that. That looks great, this is fine. Good, good, good. Okay, that'll all coat well. Gotta get the door. So, that should be ready to paint. All right, that's the most important coat because that's the black coat and that will hide all the crimes of the other black coats. Did I just do that? I started with the wrong paint. It doesn't really matter, <laughs> but I just sprayed that with the textured when I meant to start with the primer. It's not that big a deal. that sit for a minute and think about what it did. So my cutaway model now has a coat of black paint, but it's a little too smooth and uniform. I tried out the um, Rust-Oleum textured paint and I, I understand what it kind of does, but it's so low texture, it doesn't really help me. The reason being is I don't want this just to be a dark value. I kind of want it to eat the light. I want it to be a negative draw on your attention. And the way I want to do that is I want to add a, just a little bit of texture to this so it's, you really understand it's not something you should be looking at. And when you want to add texture to a paint job, one of my favorite ways is this really weird way of using, wait, where did it go? Ah, here. Spray adhesive. This is Super 77. This is sort of, uh, this is sort of, the lifeblood of the spray <laughs> adhesive industry. Like everyone uses 77. There's a multiple kinds, but 77, uh, well, I'll show you. I'll show you what I did with 77. I made, um, I made the hero guns on the front of the Mjolnir for uh, the Matrix sequels when it crashes through the door. So these were actually mounted to the fiberglass buck that crashed through the doors of the dock. And I got a CG reference model that I broke apart in Rhino, turned into some laser cuts, and then I did all the model making on this. This was really, this was like a reward for me towards the end of the Matrix sequels. Um, Mike Lynch, my supervisor, was like, you wanna just build that thing from scratch? And I'm like, oh, yeah, I do. So um, you can see it's got this heavily cast iron texture, and that was all done with multiple layers of Super 77 and primer. Uh, and it, the practice would be I laid down primer, then I laid down a little 77, let it dry, put primer on top of that. Lay down another, let that dry, put primer on top of that. I think it's like four or five passes with light sanding between them. And then you end up with this really nice variegated mottled texture that feels very much like, um, like it's been cast in iron. Um, and why do I have this? Because, well, I asked the mold room for one more gun than I needed for production and I took this one home. I don't think anyone's gonna get mad at this point. So that, is, I'm not going for this texture. I'm not even going for this texture, but uh, I will be, I will be, uh, the 77 will add a dimensional 
feel to it that I hope just allows you to concentrate your attention on the inside of the cockpit, not anything else. You want to wait until it's no longer tacky, which is where it's at. I'm going to hit it with some more primer. All right. The next step is we'll peel off the tape, but I'm going to let it dry for a little while. Time for the unwrapping, the moment of truth. And every time you pull off masking, it's like Christmas. I mean, and I mean that in the full scope of what Christmas can be. It can be crushing disappointment or spectacular wish fulfillment. Let's start with the back. Now this transition will get cleaned up. This will end up being painted red so that you know you're looking at a cutaway model. Overspray, what I tell you? And if you're in a shop with lots of people, it's incumbent on you to take the tape ball and throw it at somebody. Not hard, just it's that's like that's just required. Cut a Wilhelm scream in there. <laughs> ah! Ladies and germs. That's lovely. That's really great. I'm very happy. All right, let's take this stuff off. All right, let's power on. Hey! Is that everything? Yes. Yay! Very nice. I, uh, Look at you. I was fully expecting to mess something up. <laughs> wow. That is great. Handled with care. It really looks terrific, too. Excellent. Cool. I'm so pleased that we don't have more, that I didn't create more work for us to do. <laughs> yeah, no, this is great. It looks fantastic. Um, it's such a pretty model. We are in the painting phase of our ship, which means we're coating everything with a primer coat to give it a base on which to lay on all the other paint. And it's a lot of pieces, it's a lot of primer, and it's better not to just wait for the primer to dry, it's better to kind of bake it, make it accelerate its setting. And to do that, I'm gonna make a painting oven, and it's a, uh, it's a pretty straightforward build. It's even more straightforward than you think it is. We start with this. This is the basis of our drying oven for parts. And I have made dozens of these over the years. This is one of my favorite constructions. So the first thing you do is, yeah. Step one is get the box. Step two is cut a hole in the box. And then, let's see here. Uh, and let's see, and wait, almost. Great, we're done. <laughs> uh, so, this is the thing. 
when you set this up with a part inside and you roughly close it, just like that, just like that, you get this really dry box that's just slightly over like 100 degrees Fahrenheit, which is fantastic for drying stuff without melting it. Uh, so there's our painting dry box. Hey, Kate. The oven's ready for drying parts. Oh, why well, thank you. You're welcome. Oh, so there we go. And just bake it at 350 for 30 minutes and come back and it'll be delicious. All right, sir. Oh, you glued some of these, you made a... I glued these in. Uh, but these also aren't broken off anymore. I, those are new, yep. Yay! Those are replaced. Like I just did what you said, I cut off the other ones and made an insert. Right. So if these break, we can just take them off and put on new Amazing. ones. Amazing. Yeah. But um, I beefed them up as well. Uh, so go, um, one of my, okay, right, that's where I go. Great. That's we great. actually, we're, this is gonna be, this is gonna be our filming side, so let's go from this side. Lovely. Yeah. Uh, then let me make a mark, just so I can memorialize that. So this whole thing, yeah. magnets on, so just oh, take it that's off. that's awesome. Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna cut away. Marvelous. Yeah. You want to take it off to do that? Uh, no, that? I don't think All I'm right. ready to do that just yet. Okay. Yeah, when I do, I think yeah. I can just bring in a, a Dremel yeah. circular saw and wham. Yeah, it'll um, cut out real easy. Yeah. Cool. So yeah, so. So we'll, what's in front of us here? So Kate's got everything primed. Yeah. Uh, we're gonna do some railings and Ooh. strut work. So you can kind of see this is a stand-in mm -hmm. that the the ship, the game model has all this cool Oh, I see, work. this is the only one that actually has them. Yeah. They go here and they go all over, okay. Yep, so this is a 332nd inch rod. Um, and uh, we're just gonna put it, it's nice thing it's the same on all of them. We're just gonna put these in, glue them in, and then we can, we can paint it. The other thing we're gonna do is some little railings, kind of like you did on the ramp. Oh, okay. That we're gonna put on the outside here, oh, on the hall here. Nice, and yeah. those are thinner. Yep, so there's some. And uh, you have the brass that we need. Yes, Lovely. and we can bend that by hand and just yes. glue it in place. Do you wanna do the struts and I'll start on the railing? Sure, and absolutely. Do we have yes. picture reference for the railing? Is it coming and sort of matching this curve? So here's our reference for the uh, railings. So we're going to be building this uh, right here. Oh, they snake a little bit. Yep. And I have these standoffs if you want to use them. I'd rather not. I figured. Yeah, that's how it is. Actually, they're 3D printed? Yeah. Oh, so they, actually, yeah, let's break them out. They thread right on. No, those will, those will, they yeah. just can glue in. So, and it's duplicated up here on the top cowling. Okay. It's exactly the same. Oh, I love all this visual reference. I know. <laughs> the large format printer was awesome. I like 16th better. Dink. You, mo <laughs> you monster. I know. <laughs> mm -hmm. So so I have a whole I, bunch of 16th inch rod, but I, I think I'm going to go with the thinner rod actually now. Yeah. I, I like press fits. I like, you know, yep. dimensionally stable fits, but I don't want to be forcing and snapping and gluing and drilling. Okay. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 16 total of the corner rails. Yep. And they're all pretty identical to each other in the spacing. I think right. so because they're looking to be efficient. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they no, just, I, whatever layout here, they duplicated it, I guarantee you. I appreciate model, that. So, yeah. I appreciate that about them. Yep. Right, there's these guys, which we can. Yeah, we can do it like that. One. Here, like that. So because I have 16 of these little railings to make, I am effectively uh, assembly lining them. I'm making the first curve, which is out of here, which is a 90 degree on the biggest 20 millimeter, but uh, assembly lining them means that they'll all be identical and that will actually help me in scale. That will actually help sell the scale of the ship that they are 
matching you each other. You don't have any weird wiggles or bumps or, yep, yeah, yeah. Those those can draw your eye and make you like, what is that doing? Oh, that's all right. <laughs> so yeah. at, uh, this is unlike how I normally work, but this is one case where I did not measure any of these rods. So okay. we had to put all this strut work in here. So I, I, I just, I just eyeballed. Yeah, I just I just put them in and marked them by hand, and then I'm just going to duplicate them by cutting a bunch. Yeah, but the funny thing is, so these we had a problem early on. I was a little worried about these little guys, which are are some kind of like uh, docking clamp or something. Yeah, and we man just snap every single one of them off. I, I, I helped. I snapped <laughs> you, several off, uh, and that was partly I didn't have them beef as beefy as they should. I just printed them as is, and you had a great idea where. We basically sawed all of them off, and then I just reprinted a new insert that we glued it goes in. on top. And we beefed these up. Now, and also what's gonna help is these actually get tied in with the metal strut work. Right. So by the time I glue these in, these should be, we they should, should not have snap any anymore. anymore. I'd appreciate that. <laughs> a little bit there. I'm gonna play around here. I'm happy with that. Uh, so are you gonna do the. The standoffs? The connecting piece? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 I love it. Wait, that was, wait, so wait. That, oh, right, I haven't done those. That goes in all there. Right. Dude, I love it. So I'm just going to bending all these by hand. All right, these are looking good. I am doing these railings thinner because it's the one. All right, so model making is all about the perfect being the enemy of the good. It's all about hiring people who know how to prioritize what looks good on camera. Because with n amount of time, you can make a perfect model, but there's never the perfect amount of time. So you have to find the efficiencies. And when you're selling scale, there are certain things that you cannot, oh, I don't have my glasses for this, here we go. There are certain things when selling scale that you can't let go. So if you take a look at this railing here, that railing looks great for scale. And this one on the other side does not. Do you see it? Because this bend is too sharp, and that means the top of this railing is bowing down. And that bowing, it draws my eye and doesn't look like it's the scale it should be. That one does. So I've got to come in with needle nose pliers and fix that bend. And if I can, I just have to pull the whole thing and replace it. But like, that's what I'm talking about, about the little precisions that sell the thing to be the scale that it's supposed to be. So I don't have glue up here, so I'm just gonna try and do a er uh, er uh, and a er uh, er uh, and see if that can help. Here we go, er uh, and er. Uh. That was it. That's literally it. That tiny, tiny amount so that the bow no longer happens, when that paints, those will sell the scale. That simple. I got the strut work installed on all of these. And one, so we installed this metal core that Adam machined, and that's going to allow us to, to mount the uh, landing gear right into that. But as an extra, just extra little precaution, we also made these, which are pins that go directly into the block, which just then engage that. So if it wants to start torquing like this way, they're just a little something extra. I don't think they're necessary, but it makes me feel better. <laughs> and then, you, and no then we never the, regretted more structure. I know, and then we got the steel rods that are going to go in there that also uh, act as the what they make the pistons. Little pistons. I, know. <laughs> I love that. Um, this guy can go back on here. All right, I will do that. Um, Those look great. Don't they look great? They look really good. Yeah, I'm very happy. 
I think we are. I think we are done with, with our, the strut work. Yep. There's uh, no more over here. Nope. Dude. The only thing we have to add later is there's probably some hoses that we want to do in the landing gear, gotcha. but I don't think we want that on there before we paint. No, and we that's, totally don't. Kate's already started on some of the other stuff, and and I think at this point we can hand this off to her to do the paint job. Dude, really? This <laughs> time? Yep. <gasps> We've reached the painting part. Um, this is great. That was I, I'm just really happy with how this is going. Good. This is it's a it's, lot of model. <laughs> This is a, a lot, lot of, of mod. This I is, mean, we've seen our chest full of parts. It's I just a lot like of back in the ILM days, this would have been like a million dollar model. This I, I don't oh, I don't I'm know really how much you'd actually pain. bid at it, but this would be in the this would be in the you know several people for weeks and weeks doing yeah. something like this from scratch. Yeah. Well, I have to hand it. Uh, I've, we got a lot of help from the modelers who worked on the games. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, that that shortened the the struts look great. Yep, I love it. And also, it actually made things actually, they're actually doing the job that they're right, supposed they're to do. It actually made everything stronger. These aren't gonna snap off anymore. Oh, that's great. Um, and we got our pins in the landing gear and we'll wait to put the steel rods in until after we paint and then we'll be done. Yeah. Dude, let's uh, bring it over to Kate for painting. All right. <laughs> Looks cool. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Wait until you see this thing once I put all the pistons on this. This oh. is the coolest part, but it needs to be way painted first. So. <laughs> yeah. Tiny astronaut in the G holding on to it. Exactly. Okay, Kate, colors, colors. Colors everywhere. We're finally in the color zone. So tell me, tell me what we're, what's going on. So I basically took every color that we had that could have possibly worked for this model, okay. and I sprayed samples on some, you know, leftover pieces we had. I like to do it on this. You get some of those curves. You can mm -hmm, see the mm -hmm. light, and you can see them compared next to each other. I like that. Um, what are your thoughts after laying these down? You've immersed your head in the color palette of this guy. And this isn't this isn't like perfect canon, right? We're no. not having to match a thing because people customize these. Exactly. So okay. we get to customize it as well. Uh, but if we're going off of some of this reference we have, I'm definitely leaning towards this white here. It's as called, a base. As a base, And yes. that's the, this that's, is the insignia. Yes, insignia white. And we're in an issue because we have one can of this and a whole ship. Yeah. Okay. Um, I had, we, we talked about this off camera. My suggestion is I have five or six cans of this matte white, mm -hmm. sort of a primer. My inclination is to, because I have enough, I think, to coat the whole model in this to do that mm -hmm. and then get a dust coat on it of this. Maybe even paint it in this, assemble it, and paint it in this. I think that's a great idea. And that means we get the color cast we want, mm -hmm. which is that nice deadened yeah. sort of... It's almost a green to it. It really is lovely. I. One of my favorite things at ILM was going to talk to the painters and asking mm -hmm. for help to get to a color. Because I'd be like, my purple's all washed out. And they're like, you got to use the opposite side of the color wheel. <laughs> and I got like so much smarter trying learning from those amazing painters. Oh, yeah. You're right. There is green in there. Mm -hmm. and a little pink, too. Yeah. Let's coat everything in this extremely bright white, and then we'll <laughs> kill it with this. Sounds like a plan. I like that. I like that because people don't realize how white a lot of the Star Wars ships started out. Yeah. The Millennium Falcon is famously reefer white. And when you buy a can of reefer white, you're like, this can't be right. No. I, if you were to ask me what color the Millennium Falcon was or anybody else, they would say gray. Yeah, Battleship Gray. Yeah. Which would be like so dark, it would almost disappear. Exactly. Weirdly. Okay, so we'll go with that. And then on top of that, what are the colors that stood out? I, I, this is a yellow we have. Yes. Uh, that, that seems to me like a perfect one-to-one. -one. Exactly. And then one of the things we, I was playing with here is we have this dull red, which I got. And then looking at some of the reference, it looks like it was almost too dull. So I did a test where I sprayed an apple red on top of it, both um, super opaque mm -hmm. and then like misting towards the edge. So you could get a, an idea of what it would look like by doing that if you wanted to lighten it up. So... I really like the misting effect here. Mm -hmm. I really like how much depth that gives the color. And it also weirdly feels a little like 
old paint. It does, right? Right? Like, this is so <laughs> monochromatic. I yeah. mean, and also, I look at this and I just think primer red. Yeah. Which is one of my favorite colors, to be sure. But that's kind of awesome. I, yeah, I think it gives a, a bit of depth to it. And we're not... The stuff that gets this color is like panels and pieces, not exactly. huge chunks or nacelles or things. Yeah. So I, I think we definitely have a workable solution here. All right. And then I got a bunch of different blacks. Ah. Um, at least, so this one's a rubber black, which you can see is, yeah. is much more dulled and mm -hmm. has that gray tone to it. And then we've got um, a semi-gloss black here. Mm -hmm. um, and then this is like a metallic black if you wanted yeah. to catch the light yeah. a little bit more. My inclination for scale is to go with that. I like that one a lot. And then we can, we can, we can make this reflective selectively with specular yes. coats and other stuff. Well, not to mention there are things like um, here, I've got a sample of some rub and buff ebony. Mm -hmm. So anywhere that you wanna like mix it up a little bit, yeah. you can just use that. Or we also have some Gundam markers. That's great, that's great. Yeah, the semi-glosses tend to show some of the crimes of the of the yeah. original model, yeah. and it's fascinating, <laughs> and that definitely hides it. Um, okay, and then I think that's the perfect black. I think you're totally right. I'm into that one. Um, we also have a bunch of, yeah, silvers and golds to choose from. It's interesting, I got this spray gold thinking, that's definitely what we're looking for. Mm -hmm. I sprayed it, I didn't like it. Yep. So then I did a second test where I sprayed it on black because that oh, changes the way it looks. It really does. But this European rub and buff gold is pretty spot on to what we have in our reference. So it can also be something we make up on the fly. Do we want to just spray it and add some rub and buff or do we rub and buff the whole pieces? You Let's, know? As we're allocating, those are choices that we can make. And again, if we get it wrong, we just mask it and redo it. Exactly, that's one of the things I love the most about paint is you kind of can't mess it up too bad. You say that, <laughs> and yet my experience in mixing paint is I would try and get this purple and I'd end up with like three gallons of the wrong color. And I keep on adding. Well, that's where I come in. I, I delight in color matching, so put me in a room and I'll get it right eventually. Okay, um, so I think that's it. Are those the main decisions yeah, we're talking about here? I think so. And then just for funsies, because there are a few bits of darker grays around, mm -hmm. I have a whole complement of different grays to choose from, including I went ahead and just left a straight primer yeah. gray visible. Primer's nice. Um, That's yeah. lovely. Is that a gunmetal? Yeah. So that, that one is actually, let's see, that one's 42. That is light gunmetal. So this one, I swear, what, what I like about it is it's not quite semi-gloss. Yeah. And we could make this pop like hell with a little silvering in the corner exactly. and stuff. Exactly. Which um, we have a few more of the rub and buff and yep, chrome yep, samples yep. up here. Um, this is great. I like this gray too. I think this one might end up being too, well, I don't know actually. I mean, those complement each other they quite do, nicely. Yeah, there's a again. You start to see a bit of green in yeah, there yeah. Uh, to my eyes. <laughs> my 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 father was in, inordinately good at color matching, and he would always do that when we were kids. I'm like, look at all the green in that sky. And I remember being eight and being like, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> um, that is awesome. Okay, and we can start to divvy this up. Now we get to paint. I know. I'm very excited. I've been waiting a while for this. Uh, Sean! Sean! It really does look like an animal. Hey, guys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're ready for painting, dude. Yeah, so we're just going to basically take apart everything we put together. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Let's well, part it out. We're going to do this in a couple of passes. First, we're going to separate all these pieces and spray paint them a, uh, a basic white. Then we're going to bring this back together, and we're going to hit it with a Insignia White, which is a much uh, so deader, darker. Yeah. And that'll, we don't have any more than one can of Insignia White, so we gotta make the best use of it. We'll get everything coated, <laughs> then Insignia White will no bring pressure. it all to cohesion. Yeah, all right. Then we take it apart again and we'll divvy it up for the color. Cool. Go. 
looks like I'm getting this whole thing in one can. Now, I'm not trying for a perfect bright white coat. I'm actually trying for a tonal evening out of this whole thing because I'm going to hit this with the Insignia White afterwards to try and give it that color cast of the Insignia. This is just more like a base tone. I'm going with super light coats right now because at this stage in the model making, if I got a big drip out of spray paint, it could be a real disaster because it could happen on a part of the ship that I don't have access, easy access to for sanding, and I'm going to have to address it before continuing. So it could really gum up the works to get a drip. So instead of the normal, like, you know, six to 10 inches, I'm literally just like breezing by while doing this and kind of getting a mostly coat. And do you know how I know to do that? Is because I screwed it up and had to spend half a day fixing something because I was lazy for one second. That's the last thing. Ooh, 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 I didn't get a drip. No, I didn't get a drip. Uh, yeah, yes, outstanding. This is one of those days where I will go in there and I'll scrub the crap out of my hands and they still won't look clean. They'll, they'll be clean, like I'll eat with them. <laughs> Although that's not necessarily the marker you want for clean. They'll be clean, but I go home and my wife is like, can you wash your hands? And I'm like, I, okay, here's what, here's the best we can do. <laughs> Here we go. I use the fast orange. It's got uh, like pumice in there for scrubbing. It's a lot of scrubbing. Oh, I love the warm water. One of my weird proclivities is I love doing dishes. I really do. I love the water. I love cleaning things up, like it's a little bit of my OCD, you know, like making the kitchen spotless. Not like it's always spotless, but like when it's time to make it spotless, I like that. Oh my God, my poor fingernails. Who cleans their hands with a dirty rag? There we go. That's actually not, that's not so bad, but yeah, yeah, see that? That's after scrubbing. Yeah, clean hands. Can I make you a sandwich? <laughs> Follow along in the coming weeks as the tested team and I continue our work on these models, scratch building, lighting, painting, detailing, and prepping these miniatures for filming. Thanks to Bethesda Game Studios for partnering with us on this project and inviting us to play in their new universe. Starfield launches on Xbox Series X, S, PC, and Game Pass on September 6, 2023, and is rated M for Mature. You can find details below or visit www.starfieldgame.com to learn more.